Good evening, everyone. We're here at Streetlight Ministries, um, and we are going to have a good old discussion about the, the times we're living in. We're going to start with Ezekiel 37, because Ezekiel 37, I taught on it years ago before we were ever online. Ezekiel 37 through Ezekiel 48 is an exact timeline of what's going to happen at the time that just before and after Jesus returns. I don't know of any other stretch of chapters in the Bible that will give you the exact timeline that Ezekiel does. Um, so we're going to start tonight with Ezekiel 36. Um, and over the next couple months, we're going to go through... Um, all the way to Ezekiel 48, the end of the chapter, which culminates with the end of the millennial reign, which will then lead us to the White Throne Judgment. So we're going to get started. Um, we'll pray, and then, and then we're going to have a good old discussion. So uh, I look forward to this. Heavenly Father, I glorify you. We thank you that you have sent your Son so that we have an avenue a reason to be hopeful in a world that is <laughs> dying. Um, we're watching it before our eyes, but it shouldn't be a shock to us because you told us it would, and you told us how it would. And we're going to discuss that tonight, some of it. And we thank you, Lord, that you have made a way where there is no other way. You sent Jesus here to lead us and to guide us and to create an example so that we can be with you, with you one day in your heavenly kingdom, and then and then eventually to a new heaven and a new earth. Thank you so much, my Father. Thank you so much, Jesus, for everything you did, and thank you, Holy Spirit, for your wisdom. In the name of Jesus, Yehoshua HaMashiach, <clears throat> amen. Okay, here we go. And I get a little emotional, so sorry. Um, Ezekiel 36, verse 1. You, son of man, prophesy to the mountains of Israel and say, Mountains of Israel, hear the word of Adonai. So God is talking to Ezekiel. And he's saying, prophesy to the mountains of Israel. Now again, you've heard me talk before. Man, has, man and angels have a spirit of God. We have his DNA. In, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 6, it says, He breathed ruach, which is a spirit, and then he breathed a breath, nashem. Nashem means the name of God. So he gave us a spirit and then put within us his own DNA. Because that's why we're eternal. And, and, and that's what, nashem means the name the name is only the one of, of Jehovah, and Jehovah gave us his DNA, which made us eternal. So there is no way that we can die, our, our spirit. Flesh, that's not even ours. It's a temporary dwelling. But our spirit and our soul will remain with God forever or separated from God, depending on where you are. Um, but... There it says that he created us with his DNA. And the angels were created the same way. That's why he said, I had to create hell. He said, I created hell for Lucifer and his angels. Because he couldn't kill them. They're eternal. They're part of him. Just like we are. But I say all that because the mountains and the rivers and the rocks and the stones and the fish and the birds and the and the and the the beasts of the field. They have a spirit from God, not of God, from God. They're not eternal. So, and, and people, I've had so many pastors gasp in a Bible study when I say that. And I said, can you not read? Or do you not read scripture? Because it's very clear. And, and I was teaching at a Jewish synagogue, Messianic Jewish, they believe in Jesus, but they don't believe in the New Testament, which is kind of funny. They believe in the five books of the Torah, and that's, they draw the line. They will read even the Tanakh, the, the writings and the prophets, but they don't consider them holy. 
because only the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, it says were given from the mouth of God to Moses. Everything else was given and inspired by the Holy Spirit. So they don't recognize it. We do. And I have had people say, <coughs> I've had pe people, including past, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> including pastors say, to, no, I'm good. Including pastors say um, that there's been too many people's hands. And that's a common thing in seminaries now. That there's been too many man's hands in the Gospels and they don't trust them anymore. That's not the word of God. And I said, do you understand what you're saying? You are saying that Satan is more powerful than God because God can't protect his word from Satan. Because if he, can't, if he can't maintain his word and keep it holy and to keep it righteous, then are we serving the wrong one? Because if Satan has the power to over, overturn what God has put together, then we got a problem. But that's not true, as we know. The, Satan has no authority over God. God can trample him like, like I swat a mosquito. Um, but um, th there's no way that, that Satan can affect that word because it was written by the Holy Spirit through men. So it wasn't, it wasn't written by men. What, but I will say translations... I'm talking about going back to the original now, the, the Hebrew and the Greek. Because if I go to certain translations, sure, absolutely, they've been corrupted. All of them. Why? Because those translations are written by people who belong to de certain denominations. And it's amazing, people from every de denomination on the planet have, have created their own Bibles translation. And amazingly, stunningly, it always matches their denomination's stance on, on, on everything. And that's because they, they, want, they believe what they believe and they shape God's word to equal them. But as you've heard me say, um, if, if the Bible is the DNA of Jesus, just like we are the DNA of Jesus, the Bible is also the DNA of Jesus so if we alter the word of God, are we altering a book or are we altering a God? And I will not stand before a book at the time of the end. I will stand before a God. So woe to you who changes the word and misleads my children. He said, if you cause one of these little ones who believes in me to stumble, be better if a millstone were hung around your neck. Matthew 18:6. So um, <clears throat> I know I went on a little bit of a rabbit trail, and then you all know that I'm prone to that. So, but anyway, I just want to say that God's word is God's word. So we, we don't have the right to manipulate it, and we better not. Thus says Adonai Elohim, <clears throat> the enemy has said against you, aha, even the ancient high places have become our possession. Now, I started to say, if you go to Genesis chapter 9, it says that, that God said, promised Noah that he put a, a rainbow in the sky as a promise that he would never flood the earth again. But we missed the second part of that covenant. The second part of that covenant is that I will put the fear of man in every beast of the field, fowl of the air, and fish of the sea. Now, Animals have free will, too, because remember, they have a spirit from God. So he says, but if they shed man's blood, which means if they go against what I commanded them, which means they have free will, then by man's hand, their blood must be shed. So all of us have free will. And people will say not even man, man doesn't have free will. Angels don't have free will. I say bull. Um, even the cattle of the field and the lions and the tigers and the, and the sheep and the goats, and they all have free will. Why do you think Jesus said, I'm going to separate the sheep and the goats? Because the sheep are, the sheep are docile. We are the sheep. And, he, and, and we follow the shepherd because we know his voice. They had to, they had to build the, the pens for goats twice as high as they did the sheep because the sheep did everything they could to get out. Because they were rebellious. 
<clears throat> that's why an animals are different, but they have their own free will. Those goats, they're the symbol of rebellious humans. That's the way, that's what God says. <clears throat> the other thing is goats stink. And if you look at, if you look at, um, in Isaiah, he, he says uh, that he will separate um, the sheep from the goats the, at the time of the end. He will separate us, not by sight, not by sound, but by smell. Because they will have the, those who are destined for hell will have the stench of death on them because hell is the second death. It's like, you know, you drive down the road in the middle of the summertime when it's 90 degrees and you drive past a dead animal on the side of the road. That's what Jesus will smell when, when he returns. Therefore prophesy and say, thus says Adonai Elohim, because they ravaged and, and crushed you from every side, so that you became the possession of the rest of the nations and you became the talk and the evil gossip of people. Now, who's he talking to? I mean, is he talking to the Israelites or is he talking to the mountains? What did he say right here? Prophesy to the mountains. Because what does it say in Isaiah 55? It says it in many places. A psalm, I can't remember which psalm it is. I want to say it's, it's not Psalm 51. Psalm Psalm, you know which one it is, Carl? Oh. It says it says that even the, the, the mountains and the and the valleys will sing my praise. The rivers and the rocks will cry out and they will prophesy. So I but but I'm saying he's talking to the land of Israel. He's apologizing because the land of Israel didn't do anything wrong. It was the people who maintained it or were that God gave them that land to maintain. But if you if you look at all Jewish writings, point to the fact that that the the nation of Israel, and you can take if you take the the coordinates that is given in Genesis for the for the um, Garden of Eden, and you place them on a map. And you take the coordinates of what God had promised Abraham he would give him of Israel, put that those coordinates on the map, they're identical. So I believe wholeheartedly that, that the Garden of Eden sits right where it always did sit. I mean, I remember when I was a little boy and they said that, um, that the Garden of Eden got washed into the sea. Well, it doesn't say that. It says that he put an angel in front of it with a flaming sword. If it got washed into the sea, he wouldn't have to do that. It sits right where it always did, but when God, when God created the heavens and the earth, how did he do it? Colossians 1.16 um, and, and, and other verses. The, as a matter of fact, Genesis chapter 1, if you read it in Hebrew, says the same thing. That God created all things, both visible and invisible, through, through Jesus. So if he can make take all the things that he that were invisible, like atoms and, and and neutrons and all the things that we can't see with the naked eye, if he can take those and turn them visible, why can't he take what's visible and turn it invisible? So why couldn't he take the Garden of Eden and say, yeah, I'm going to put that right there. I'm going to leave it right there, because one day, my people Israel will will get that land back, and it will be the Garden of Eden again. If you look at the description of Israel during the millennial reign, it says that that that, that it will the 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 um the desert will flourish like a rose, Isaiah 35, and that that the people will be who are required to come to Jerusalem once a year will will travel down the highway from northern Af Africa into into Jerusalem. And there will be merchants set up all the way along in the desert because the desert will be blossoming like a like a rose. So, um, if you look at it, what that what that looks like, it, it the description of it, and even now, I mean, I mean, we talked about this a month ago that 
um, <clears throat> that in Israel, dairy cows give up one and a half times the amount of gallons of milk in a year per cow as anywhere else in the world. To tomato plants give up, grow 1.25 more pounds of tomatoes than any other, any other tomato plant in the world. I mean, you can go right through every crop that they have. The Netherlands is buying a plane load of tulips from Israel every day because Israel can now grow tulips better than, than the Netherlands. This is God's promise. This is what he said. Prophesy to those mountains. It's not always going to be bad for you. One day, you will wear that crown again. And, and, then, and then when you, when, you, when you look at the new Jerusalem that, that comes down from heaven, guess what those coordinates are? They're going to come and sit on the nation of Israel. Because all three of those coordinates equal 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. And they're all the same piece of land. And according to Jewish writings and Jewish folklore, Adam was created on Mount Moriah, the Temple Mount. Everything happens in that place. Everything. Therefore, mountains of Israel, hear the word of Adonai. Thus says Adonai Elohim to the mountains, the hills, the streams, and the valleys, the desolate wastes, and the cities that are forsaken, which have become prey and derision to the rest of the surrounding nations. That's got to be eating God alive, that, that the land that he considers holy is being abused, and it has been for a long time. Therefore, thus says Adonai Elohim, surely in the fire of my wrath, I have spoken against the rest of the nations and against all Edom. Now that name will come up a lot at the time of the end. Edom. And who, who is Edom? It's the descendants of Esau. Um, that have taken my land for themselves as a possession with the joy of all their heart and the contempt in their souls in order to seize it as plunder. Psalm 83 a song of Asaph. God, do not keep silent. Do not hold your peace, O, o God. Do not be still. For look, your enemies make an uproar. Those who hate you lift up their head. They make a shrewd plot against your people, conspiring against your treasured ones. Come, they say, let's wipe them out as a nation. Let Israel's name be remembered no more. How many times have we heard that in the news over the last 10 years? And I got a picture up here of the guy who started it all. For, for with one mind, they plot together against you, and they make a covenant. They're mocking God by saying, we're going to destroy Israel. And the tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab, the Hagarites, Gebel, Ammon, Amalek. Now, <clears throat> let's take a look at this. The tents of Edom. Look it up. Um, uh, Google, uh, now don't use Google, use Bing, and, and, and go and look up um, tents of the Palestinians in, in Jordan. That was all a game. Those, those are not... There's no such people as Palestinians. These are Arabs who happened to be living in Israel. And in 1967, um, Saudi Arabia um, and Jordan, Syria, and Egypt said, hey, you, all you Arabs that are living in Israel, come over here. We, we got tents for you set up. And, and we will wipe Israel out in three days. And then you can go back into Israel and take the choicest lands that, that, that they have. And so they all came out thinking in three days they were going to have all these great farmlands and all the, all the beautiful areas of Israel. But it's now 2023 and they're still living in tents in Jordan. 
and the Jordan and, and the people of Jordan won't let them assimilate into the Jordan people because they use it for political gain, saying that look at these evil Israelites, they force these people to live in tents. Israel had nothing to do with them living in tents. They didn't tell them to go there and live in tents. They're not holding them in, in, in tents. The Jordanians are. But they're blaming Israel. Yeah. And that's and and God's listening to that. But these are this is this is the tents of Edom, the descendants of Esau, the Ishmaelites, which is northern Saudi Arabia. Um, in, in, in Ezekiel 38 and 39, we will talk when we when we'll get there in probably a month. Um, this is what is also referred to in the Bible as Sheba and Dedan. It says Sheba and Dedan will become friendly to Israel at the time of the end. What are they doing right now? They're negotiating a peace treaty with Israel. <laughs> the Ishmaelites. And, and, and God said that Sheba and Dedan, when, when the enemies of Israel come to attack Israel, it says Sheba and Dedan will say, have you come to take a spoil? They will, st they will condemn the enemies of Israel for attacking, um, even though they get the snap beat out of them. Oh, right, right. But those are the descendants of Ishmael, the, the son of Hagar, which is the concubine, well, which is the servant of, of Sarah and the concubine of, of Abraham. Moab <coughs> and the Hagarites. Where did they come from? Where did they come from? All the enemies of Israel were actually their cousins. Who is this? Um, <laughs> I'll give you some help. No, no, no. <laughs> Uncle Abraham's nephew, right? Lot. 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 Slept with his two daughters. Yeah, yeah. Lot's kids. Mo Moab and the Amorites were the sons of those two daughters. They're right. East of Jordan, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Northeast. Yep. Northeast of Jordan. On the north side of Jordan and east. Yes. <clears throat> um, Moab and the Hagarites. Gebel, Ammon, and the and Amalek. Now, Amalek. Mm -hmm. That's because Saul wouldn't kill right. Amalek. And let his son and grandson go to to Syria, which is who tried to kill Esther, which is it's Haman. Haman was the grandson. Without if Saul would have been obedient, you look at all the times that God said, kill these people, kill all of them, kill their men, their women, their children, their cattle, their sheep, their goats. There was a reason for that, because God knows the end from the beginning, and he knew that those people would become the greatest enemies of Israel. And, and, and they couldn't see it. There he is. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Used to be the former prime minister of Iran. And he was the first that I heard. I don't know, there might have been somebody before him. But he was the first I heard in our life, in our modern day time, that said, let us, come, let us wipe Israel off the, off the face of the earth so that their name never be heard again. Yeah. That's him. Yeah. That's he also one. said that the uh, Jewish Holocaust of World War II was uh, a made up lie yeah. by the Americans and the Jews and the uh, Hollywood. But who else is saying that? The, Europe now says that. Um, the Germans say it. You know that they just they just polled German high schools, and only seven percent of German students even believe that the Holocaust was real. Regard, but they but they also the ones that even believe it's real believe that less than two hundred thousand were killed, no, not six I, million. I follow these World War II channels. You got these? They're amateurs. Okay. You have ex-Marines, ex-Army guys that, yep. are, that were over in Europe during uh, post-war peacetime, but you know we, we were part of NATO and we're still part of NATO. Okay, they're going around. They're finding.
finding all these bunkers. Oh, yeah. They're finding all of these camps, the remains of them, here, there, and everywhere in Poland and in Germany. And, and they're saying, you can't deny that something was here. And you, I don't know if you people online can hear what Carl is saying, but he's saying that the evidence is mounting mm. um, in all of, the, of Europe, all of the Middle East, with all of the, all of the wreck, the 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 ancient wreck, or well, not ancient, but the 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 carnage that happened during the Holocaust. Even now, um, um, they, they they interviewed uh, or took polls, surveys of of high school, of students in um, in the Netherlands, and they had never even heard of the Holocaust. And when they found out that the Holocaust actually occurred in the Netherlands, also, that they were just they 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 just did refuse to believe it. <clears throat> therefore, prophet, and I'm doing a Jesus short right now on therefore. It's funny because the three of the last five verses or pages that we've come to, it therefore pops up, and my my thing is therefore find out what it's there for. So. Um, um, therefore prophesy to the land of Israel and say to the mountains and to the hills the streams and the valleys thus says Adonai Elohim behold I have spoken in my wrath and in my fury because you have suffered the scorn of the nations again who's he talking to say to the mountains to the hills to the streams to the valleys I don't see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob there. I see land that is special to God. Therefore, thus said, another therefore, thus says Adonai Elohim, I have lifted my hand. Surely the nations that surround you will, will themselves suffer scorn. But you, mountains of Israel, you will shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit for my people Israel. For their return is near. Yes, amen. Now, isn't that something? Because um, there, there's been a lot of supposed, theoretically, Christian denominations who will say that the church has replaced Israel as God's people. Um, and that couldn't be more wrong. It's, it's, it's heresy. Um, and and I, I could go into a whole different rabbit trail of teaching right now that if you believe in replacement theology, then, then, the, then the, um, the covenant of G that Jesus took to the cross no longer applies to you. My I know that's a bold Bible statement. Would jump up and slap me. Yeah, yeah. For behold, I, I am for you. I will turn to you. You will be tilled and sown I will settle a large population upon you the, the whole house of Israel all of it the cities will be inhabited the desolate places will be built up I will multiply the, the man and the beast upon you they will increase and be fruitful I will cause you to be inhabited as you were before I will do better for you than at your beginnings you will know that I am Adonai. Now, if, if, I, if I look at this, what is he just saying? You at the beginning. I didn't even catch this till right now when I'm reading it. I will multiply man and beast upon you. They will increase and be fruitful. I will cause you to be inhabited as you were before. I will better you than, than at your beginnings. In the beginning... Where do we see that? John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, I can tell you when the beginning was. It was on the first day of creation, in the first hour, because Jesus was made light. He was the light of the world. That's why it says in, in John chapter 8, verse 12, Amen. He is the light of the world. He was the light of the world on the first day of creation at the beginning. 
The day did not start until he became light. Because what is required, there are two things required for time. The two things that are required for time, in heaven there's light, but there's no darkness, and there's no time. In hell, there's darkness, but there's no light, and there is no time. So what, what is required to have time is day, is light, and dark. So why do you think in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, it says, um, well, actually in, in chapter 1, verse 16, I think it says, why was the sun and the moon created on the, on the fourth day? Because to separate day and night. Why? Because um, Jesus was the light of the world, and the sun is a type and a shadow of Jesus. Because it is Jesus who holds all things in, in, in their place. By, through the will of God. Jesus is every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. God thinks it. Jesus speaks it. The Holy Spirit performs it. And on that day, in the first hour, well, it was the very first minute of time, because without Jesus becoming light, there was no time. So that is the beginning. Now, Jesus was always before that. But he became light on that day because his father was light. So he is his father. They are one. So he was made light and therefore there became time. Amen. So it's, it's, it's all, it's, it's to me, it just becomes so beautiful that Jesus, every time, Jesus went through so many transitions and has more to go. And every single time he gives of himself, and and I got to be careful because I'm I, I'm going to make a lot of people mad. So anyway, I'm going to move on. But there's a whole lot of depth in who Jesus is, and it would have been enough if he was just the Son of God, but he's far more than that, far more beautiful than that. And at the end, First Corinthians fifteen twenty four through twenty eight, you read it, and it says. It, it's here's okay now I'm on a rabbit trail um, <clears throat> you look at the first two chapters of the Bible two is the number of unity in, in, in Hebrew so the first two chapters of the Bible heaven and earth are in perfect harmony God and man are in perfect unity they're walking together in the cool of the day in the last two chapters of the Bible it's eternity and God and man are in perfect unity and, and heaven and earth they actually come down together. They're in perfect harmony. Everything in the middle is a love story on how Jesus was going to return the earth to what his father gave him. His father, through, through, through Jesus, created a perfect world where there was no sin. And Jesus, it was Jesus' world who he gave it to Adam. Adam, Adam messed that up. But at the end, Jesus returns to his father a perfect world so it's a it's a full complete cycle his father gave him a perfect world at the end he turns around and gives a perfect world back to his father because it says that at the time of the end Jesus defeats all the enemies and the last one for him to defeat is 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 hell is death and he does that at the white throne judgment he sends death to hell and then it says then he returns to his father he gives it back to his father gives what back to his father the Holy Spirit, and a perfect world. And then he steps down. It says he steps down to be on the throne with us. He gave up his place for all eternity for us. It's more than... I mean, we couldn't get to heaven without the sacrifice he did on the cross. But, and, but that was a 12-hour ordeal between getting whipped and beaten and all, all. But this gift that he is giving us at the very end, the last gift he gives us, is for all eternity. And he stepped down and relinquished his power and authority and shared it with us. He's going to. Oh, it's just absolutely mind-blowing. Okay, now, now I'm preaching enough. Now I'm going back to teaching. I will cause people my people Israel to walk upon you they will possess you and you will be their inheritance 
you will no longer deprive them of their children. Now see, this is all being prepared in Israel now for all of this stuff to happen. The Washington report, a total of 10 major U.S. denominations have gone a step beyond statements of affirmation. They are now materially participating to in, in varying degrees in the boycott, divestment, and sanction act that the United Nations has sponsored against Israel. Um, there are denominations, and I could name them, and many of you out there probably belong to them. Um, um, I don't know, maybe not the ones who are listening to me, because they hung up a long time ago. But, <laughs> but, but a denomination that I used to belong to, actually two of them, my, the one I grew up in and the one, the one that I married into, both had people go over to, it, to Jordan and Gaza and, and pick it to, to drive Israel out of their land in the 2010 to 2014 era. Um, and they are the same ones that say the church has replaced Israel. I mean, there are others too. But they have also taken a vote about four years ago to remove the churches. Their churches have their, their administration um, have, have invested a lot of money in the stock market. And is any, is any, any company that has, um, including John Deere and Microsoft yeah. and others, that has sold things to Israel to help them thrive, um, those denominations have removed their money out of their, all stocks of it that, that, that will help Israel, of companies that will help Israel. It's their loss. <laughs> he it's just said that's their loss. Um, loss. Yeah, but, it, but that loss is eternal. I will no longer let the scorn of the nations be heard against you. You will no longer bear disgrace from my people. He's talking about Israel. You will no longer cause your nation to stumble. Now he's talking about the, the people. It is a, because he didn't blame the land. He blamed the people. The Jewish people. God did. That doesn't mean he, he abandoned them. It just means he put blame where, where it belonged. He'll do the same to us. It is a declaration of Adonai. The word of Adonai came to me saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel lived in their own land, they defiled it. See, they, I mean, they defiled it by their way and by their deeds. Their way before me was like the uncleanness of a woman in, in her nada. Now, that's, Monthly unclean. Yeah. Monthly cycle. Yes. It's there. Enough said. <laughs> I scattered them among the nations, so they were dispersed through the, the countries. According to their way and, and their deeds, I judged them. Wherever they went among the nations, they profaned my holy name. Since it was said about them, these are the people of Adonai, yet they have to leave the land. But I had chosen for my holy name, which, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations wherever they went. Um, it, I don't know. When, when I first started studying the Jewish roots of our faith, which was probably 15 years ago or more, maybe 20 years ago, I just assumed because the Bible I read was written by Jews, it was preserved by Jews, and it was given to us by Jews. I figured, well, the Jews are holy, they're righteous, they're following God, they're doing all those things. And then when I started studying Judaism and the Jewish people, 80 to 90% of Jews around the world are atheists. That blew me away. But that's what the Bible actually says if I would have read it with open eyes. But because all of us were brainwashed by our denominations, I can read, back then I could read the same thing over and over and over and never see it. True. Because I already had an opinion in my head of what it was, what it was going to say. It's just like people who translate the Bible from a certain denomination. I, I don't mean 
a certain denomination, I mean any denomination. Oh, therefore, say to, therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says Adonai Elohim, I do not do this for your sake, house of Israel, but for my holy name, which you profaned among the nations wherever you went. What does he mean by this statement? I didn't do this for your sake, but for my holy name. Why does he say that? We've, you, I know you know the verse. I am, I am not a man that I should lie. God says, I cannot lie. What did God say? At least 55 verses in the Old Testament make covenant with Israel. 12 of those verses say they're, they're everlasting. So if he doesn't follow through and bring Israel, no matter what the Jewish people do, he will force them. He, may, he won't come back. If you, want, if you read scripture, he never comes back to Israel in the generation that defiled him. It's always after they die. When he was in the Sinai, he says, yeah, only the kids are going to survive. None, nobody over 20 years old is going to make see the promised land. Why? Because they defiled him. The kids didn't. But he does that over and over and over because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So when he does something, if he runs into the same situation 500 years, 1,000 years later, guess what? He's going to react the same way. He didn't forget. And he didn't make a mistake. So the first time he handled that situation, he did it right. And he'll do it right again. Question. Go ahead, Carl. Getting back to my holy name. Yep. Thus says Adonai Elohim. Expound on, that's his name. He's got one name. one name. His name is Jehovah. Jehovah. Adonai. I did a teaching about a month ago. You probably remember. Um, it, actually, it was um, a short, so I don't know if everybody if, if everybody saw it. But in that short, I talked about the four name, the four definite descriptions of God in the Bible. Genesis one and two. He uses the word. Um, Elohim. Mm -hmm. Now, Elohim can be God the Father, or it can be the Trinity. Um, be, because the I am at the end can be plural or can be singular. It's like adding an S. It's like either adding an S or having a word that ends in S, you know, in, in English. So in chapters 1 and 2, Elohim is the only name of, is the only description of God we see. Now, that word Elohim is all powerful. So then you get to verse 3, and it starts right out in the very first verse. It describes him as Jehovah. Jehovah is now talking specifically and only about God the, Fa uh, God the Father, because Jehovah is the name of God the Father. So, so and, that, and it has to be that way, and I could show you, but I don't want to go on too many rabbit trails, because it has to be Jehovah, otherwise Jesus has the wrong name and it doesn't match because his name is Yehoshua. So it's all linked in, in the spelling and all the combinations. And So in, in, in chapter 3, you see Yehovah. And from, from 3 to 12, um, you see a usage of Elohim and Yehovah, depending on what they're talking about. Elohim then is talked about when he's talking about plural. But then it but then, but um, uh, Jehovah is when he's just strictly talking about the Father. Then when we get to verse 12, we see this name. Adonai. It's not a name, it's a description. Jehovah is the name. Elohim is a description. It's a characteristic of God. It is, it is the one who is all-powerful. Adonai is, is a characteristic of God. It means master like a master of a slave. Um, he is our master. And then when we get to chapter 15, we see the one more word, one more characteristic of God, which is El Shaddai, the God of more than enough, the one that gives everything. 
So if you take that and you study it in Hebrew, the way Jew, a Jew would study it, you would say, and I don't know if they've done this, but I, I have, but I know this is how they th think through Peshat, Aramez, Drash, and so the four methods. So if you take that, he starts out with Elohim, which means we must understand that God is all powerful. There's no one greater or no one equal. And then we go to, and then we go to the next one, which is Jehovah, and Jehovah is the God who loves us. So we must understand that this all-powerful God is, is also one who loves us dearly with all his heart. And then once we understand that he is loving, then we can understand Adonai being the disciplinarian, the master, the one who teaches, the one who, he says, to those I, I love, I, I admonish. Because he corrects, in other words. And, and I can remember, you know, when I was young, all my friends' parents, I never got a whooping, but my friends all did. And, and I, I, I would see them a lot of times out in the backyard getting whooped, and their parents would always say the same thing. This hurts me more than it does you. And my friends would say, I don't think so. But, but um, we first must understand that God is all-powerful. Then we understand that God loves us very much. So then we can accept the fact that he's disciplining us as Adonai because he loves us and because he's all powerful and he knows best. He knew the end from the beginning. And then once we understand why we're being disciplined, he said, will I not in Malachi? He says, will I not open the windows of heaven and pour you out such a blessing that your storehouses cannot hold it? And that's, and that is El Shaddai, the God of more than enough. Amen. So it's beautiful when you see the way, the, if we follow the, the way we're supposed to study God's word, which is the way God gave the Jewish people, but we, uh, we abandoned the Jewish people 2,000 years ago and said they killed Jesus, so therefore, you know, we replaced them. That's, what, that's really what happened. Um, I will sanctify my great name, which has been profound, uh, profane uh, among the nations, which you have profaned among them. The nations will know that I am Adonai. It is a declaration of Adonai when I am sanctified uh, in you before their eyes. See, Jesus is going to walk in at the end of the tribulation and they are going to look upon the one they had pierced, Zechariah 12, 6, and they will mourn as if they had lost a firstborn son. But, but he is, he, um, it says here, you have profaned my name. See, he's not saving Israel because of the people. The people love God so much. He's saving Israel because he loves his name so much. His name is what he used when he declared that I cannot lie. So he loved. He said, "I love my name above all." If that's in the Book of Psalms. and bring you back into your own own land. Now, if we watch the news, they say that Israel's squatting. You know, they're, 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 they're occupying the land and we need to get them off. We need to give the Golan Heights back to Syria. But, but Syria attacked when they had the Golan Heights and Israel won. Now Syria, Jordan, Lebanon and Egypt by far had the numbers advantage, but Israel wiped them out in six days. Sorry, to the, the winner goes the spoils. Then I sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you. I will remove the stony heart from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Now, this is all of what he's talking about at the time of the end. That all of a sudden, Israel's going to go, hey, wait a minute. This, this Yehoshua, this Jesus that the Gentiles have been proclaiming, he's the Messiah. Amen. They're going to realize that. And then it says, during the, during the millennial reign, it says that, that 10 Gentiles are going to visit Jerusalem and they're going to see a Jew walking and they're going to grab the sleeve of his garment 
and say, let us go with you because you are of the people of God. That's going to be a whole lot different than it's been for the last 4,000 years. Therefore, again, the days are quickly coming, declares Adonai, when it will no longer be said, Adonai lives who brought up the children out of Israel, uh, of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Rather, Adonai, master, lives, who brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from the lands of the south, or wait a minute, and all the lands where he had banished them. So I will bring them back into their land that I gave them to their fathers. Behold, I, I will send, uh, oh, this is Jeremiah 16. Um, Behold, I will send for many fishers, and it, uh, says Adonai, and they will fish for them. After that, I will send for many hunters, and they will hunt for them. Now that's what's been going on in the last 2,000 years. Right. He says, I'm going to chase you to all the lands. And I will send for many hunters, and they will hunt for them down from every mountain, from every hill, and out of the clefts of the rocks. Now, people say to me, okay, if, if the Jews are God's people, why would he do that? And I said, can you name me one other nation that lost its borders, that lost its power, that lost its kingdom, and, and, and uh, more than 100 years later returned to their land and took back their land and be, and and came back with the same people, with the same religion, the same language, the same everything? And I said, because it, it doesn't appear anywhere in history. I said, but you know what? Israel was out of their land for 1,950 years approximately. And I said, I said, and they returned with their same religion, the same, peop the same people, the same bloodlines, and, and the same language. And I said, why do you think that happened? And I said, they are the only people in history that were chased all over the world and were never allowed to forget where they came from. Because they went to Germany and they were given stars. They went to, they went to the Netherlands and they were put in prison. They went, you, no matter where they went, they were abused, beaten, hated. They had to hide the fact that they were Jews. But you know what they had to do in order to, 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 to fear being found out to be a Jew? They had to remember they were Jews. So that when the time came in the late 1800s, um, God spoke to a, a, a Jewish man from um, England and said, I want you to recreate the Hebrew language because it was dead for over 1800 years. He said, because I'm about to bring my people back. And he created the language and then he, and then he, he started teaching, had started, this guy started teaching Rabbis, rabbis opened up Hebrew schools for other rabbis, and 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 all of a sudden, by the time 1948 came around, people were speaking Jews were speaking Hebrew again. But they went 1,800 years without it. God never let them forget who they were. For my eyes are on all their ways. They are, are not hidden from my face, nor is there uh, iniqui iniquity, iniquity um, thank you, um, concealed from my eyes. Now, iniquity, do you, I don't know if everybody, uh, I've taught on it, but I don't know if everybody's under, understanding that there are four stages of sin. There's sin, then there's trespass, then transgression. The fourth stage is iniquity. Um, iniquity is where you now sin without conscience and it causes you to lose your salvation. Now, you can get it back, um, but we, I know growing up Baptist, it was, um, it, it was called backsliding, but it's more than backsliding. It's to where you actually sin and don't care. It, it doesn't bother you at all. Um, that's why in Deuteronomy 5.9, it says, the, I, I've heard it quoted so many times, the sins of the Father will be... Um, heaped upon the, the third and the fourth generation. But that's not what it says. It says the iniquities of the father shall be heaped upon the children to the third and the fourth generation. Iniquity is very different than the sin. Sin, trespass, transgression will not take away your salvation. Iniquity, that's where you say, 
My sin is more important than God. So you have, you have broken the first commandment. You're saying, I don't care what he says. First, I will repay them double for their iniquity. Get that? He's going to repay Israel for double. What is that called? Tribulation. Two-thirds of the Jews in Israel will be slaughtered at the midpoint of the tribulation. One-third will be ushered into Amman, Jordan, Petra, and saved to the end. And they will be saved by the angel Michael because Michael's sole responsibility on the earth it's not his sole responsibility but it is his sole responsibility on earth is to protect Israel. Mike. Yes. Whether you know this or not <clears throat> studies were done studies were done about Petra. It is the only place on the earth where no radar can find find you. If you have any electronics, it just goes right over it. Pastor Carl, I don't know if you can hear him, but um, Pastor Carl is saying that they have, uh, they have tested the Petra Amman area, and <clears throat> modern technology does not function there, whether it's radar, does whether not. it's um, um, satellite not. images, no, all no. of that. So the Jews will be kept. The Jews will be kept there for three and a half years and protected by Michael. And then they, at the the last day of the tribulation, they will be protected by Jesus. The enemies will be wiped out. We see that in Isaiah 63. Jesus comes from Bozrah, which is that area, with blood on his robe, because he is destroying all of the nine enemies that are listed that we showed in um, Psalm 83. Adonai, my strength, my stronghold, my refuge in the day of affliction. To you will the nations come from the ends of the earth and say, Our fathers have inherited nothing but lies, futility, and useless things. Will man make gods for himself? Yet they are not gods. So I will surely make them know. This time I make them know my hand and my might they will know uh, that my name is Adonai. Again, when you see Adonai, he is teaching, reprimanding, whatever you want to call it. He is disciplining. That's a better word. That's the word I was looking for. When you see Adonai, Adonai's main responsibility is the discipline mm -hmm. and to fear his discipline. I will put my Ruach spirit within you. Then I will cause you to walk in my laws so you will keep my rulings and do them. Then you will live in the land that I gave to your fathers. Um, you will be my people and I will be your God. So I will save you from all your uncleanness. I will call for the, the grain and Make it plentiful. I will not bring a famine upon you. Now this is all in the millennial reign. Verse or chapter 36 is all taking us from the time the timeline from or the, the path from the um, from the end when Jesus and, and and then it takes us all the way to the end of the millennial reign before the white throne judgment. And then starting in 37, then which is where we're going to touch on next time, then he shows us from 37 to 48 exactly how he's going to do it. So I will save you from all your uncleanness. I will call for the grain and make it plentiful. I will not bring a famine upon you. I will multiply the fruit of the tree and, produce, and, and the produce of the field so that you will no longer bear the discouragement disgrace of famine among the nations. When you remember your evil ways and your deeds uh, that were not good, you will be dis disgusted with yourselves because of your iniquities and your abominations. Not for your sake will I do this. It is a declaration of Adonai. Let that be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways. 
house of Israel. See, we see Adonai again, and we're talking about, yeah, okay, you guys, you guys are going to be protected, but don't think it's because you're good. It's, but if you look at the same time, and the reason he's so openly talking about how I will not bring famine, I will not bring um, a drought, I will not bring all those things upon Israel, because he's doing it to the rest of the world during the tribulation. It says anyone who does not send their embassy or all their, their, their men, anyway, to Jerusalem on Sukkot, he said, I will withhold rain from their nation for one year. During a millennial rain. That's Zechariah again. Zechariah is beautiful. Thus says Adonai Elohim, in the, in the day that I pronounce you clean from all your iniquities, what is that? That's Yom Kippur. That's what I said will happen on the last day of the tribulation. Yom Kippur, they will see the one that they had pierced, realizing he is the Messiah, and they will mourn as if they had lost the firstborn son. So on the last day of the tribulation, this, this happens. Um, we see they are, they are forgiven their iniquities because they do sacrifices on Yom Kippur every year for the sins of Israel. That's what this is, the iniquities of Israel will finally be forgiven because for the first time the, the only true blood that can cleanse them is now one that they believe in. Zechariah 8 Thus says Adonai, I will return to Zion and dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the city of truth and the mountain of Adonai uh, Savaot Savaot, yeah, which means righteousness. So it is Adonai who is righteous. Um, will be called the, uh, the holy mountain. Thus says Adonai Savaot, once again old men and old women will sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each with his staff in his hand because of his age. Now, we know that's millennial reign because they won't be old in, in eternity. They will be old and sitting in the streets. And their staff, I think that's interesting because the staff is the shepherd's hook. It is authority. They have been given authority. The streets of the city will be full of boys and girls playing in its streets. Thus says Adonai Satsubaot. Um, it may seem difficult in the eyes of the remnant of this people in those days, but will it also be difficult in my eyes? It is a declaration of Adonai Tatsavot. Um, I think it's interesting it talks about the remnant because Isaiah 11:12 says that at the time of the end, he will go to the four corners of the earth and bring back his remnant. And when we see remnant, Unless it is otherwise specified, it is the Jewish people. Which includes those, it will include those eventually that Gentiles do accept. <clears throat> Thus says that, uh, Thus says Adonai, that, Behold, I will save my people from the land of the east and from the land of the west. I will bring them back and they will live in the midst of Jerusalem. They will be my people and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. How can people say they're not coming, that God is not coming back to the Jewish people? I don't understand. They're blind. Thus says Adonai Tatsvaot, let your hands be strong. You who hear these words spoken by the prophets, who were there the, uh, the day the foundation of the house of Adonai Tassavot was laid uh, so that the temple may be rebuilt. And they're talking about that now. But I believe what will kick it off is the war of Ezekiel 38 and 39. And when we get there, I'll share that with you. Thus says Adonai Elohim, in, 
In the day that I pronounce you clean from your iniquities, I will cause the cities to be inhabited and the ruins will be rebuilt. The land will, that was desolate will be tilled in, um, instead of being a wasteland. In the sight of all that pass by, they will say this land that was a wasteland has become like the Garden of Eden. What did we just talk about? That, that the land of Israel and the Garden of Eden are one. The waste, desolate, and ruined cities are fortified and inhabited. Then the nations that are left all around, you will know that I, Adonai, have rebuilt the ruined places and replanted what was desolate. I, Adonai, have spoken it. So it, so I will do it. Again, we're talking about he, he cannot lie. When I said I will, I will make them uh, my fortified cities, guess what that means? I will make them my fortified cities. There's no room for interpretation. Thus says Adonai Elohim, I will again be, um, be inquired of by the house of Israel to do it for them. I will populate them with people like a flock, like the holy flock, like the flock of Jerusalem during her Moadim. Now, this word, Moadim, we, although we, we um, tend to mess it up when we see it in, in, in the Torah, because in Genesis chapter um, 1, we talked earlier about God saying that he made the sun and the moon, um, and it's, they are types and shadows of Jesus. And we're talking about Jesus right now in a Moadim. And Moadim is God's appointed days, which are his feast days, Leviticus 23. So when he says um, Jerusalem during her Moadim, now during her Moadim, bless you, is talking about the holy days of the Father, the ones that bring attention to him, that point the Jewish people to God. The ones that they forgot so many years ago and the ones that we have never acknowledged never until now there are there is a breakout of gentiles who are starting to say wait a minute because i've said to many people um, about the feast days and they say well those are jewish holidays and i said really where does it say that and and i take them right to leviticus 23 and i said can you show me that these are Jewish and they read it and then it then it says and these are my feast days says the Lord it doesn't say they're the Jews these are God's feast days he that he gave to the Jews so if we are going to be his people then his feast days should be our feast days too that's why we're grafted into the Jews All done. Well, hopefully you enjoyed that. Um, I know I went on a couple of rabbit trails, maybe more than a couple, but um, um, it, they are important. And next time we're going to talk about Ezekiel 37, and I really think you're going to um, you'll enjoy Ezekiel 37. I, I do believe that um, it's going to be all about the reformation of Israel. 38 and 39 are about to happen now, chapter 38 and 39. We won't get to those in the next one, but I will do those two together, 38 and 39, because they they really don't need to be two chapters. They can be one. After 38 and 39, we see the, 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 um, the tribulation start and the temple be built. And sacrifices be reinstituted for a short period of time. Um, we'll talk about why that is necessary. 43, we see Jesus returning at the end of the tribulation, um, taking his rightful place in the throne room of the new temple, the third temple that's built during the tribulation. Um, and then we see the millennial reign, which also has animal sacrifice. 
we'll talk about why that is. And then we'll see the restoration of Israel for the millennial reign, and it's beautiful. In, in, in um, Ezekiel chapters 47 and 48. So I'm looking forward to these next two months. I think we're going to have some great conversation. I hope you can tune in. I hope you're enjoying it as much as I am um, because it is all a beautiful scene. So um, we're done for the night. I went ten, nine minutes over. Sorry, but that's not uncommon. So anyway, we're going to close out. And um, everyone out there, please be blessed and be a blessing. Heavenly Father, we glorify you and we thank you for all your information, your wisdom, your knowledge, and for most of all, for your love and your patience and your, and, and your understanding of, of what it means um, to us to know that you love us that much, that you sent Jesus to take all of our sin. We glorify you and help us to, to spread the gospel because so many are hurting. It is so important in this day and age that people come to know and understand that there is a way. You have made a way where there is no other way. Thank you, Father, in your precious and holy name. Amen.